Welcome back, everybody. Got Mr. Christie with me here today. He's going to tell us a little bit about his high school career, his college career, and what it was like getting into teaching. Mr. Christie, you played three sports in high school, football, skiing, and track. Uh, let's go over football. You were over at Newport High School. What was that like playing football over there? Um, Newport was, uh, it was fun. It was uh, we, one of those small town communities where you, you know everybody, obviously. You have the local rivalries. We had Claremont, we had um, Franklin, uh, some of the schools we played. This was back in the 90s when there were three divisions. So, and we were pretty good. We, had, we went to the playoffs every year and went to the championship game once. Um, so it was, it was a fun time. What year did you go to the uh, championship? It was 1993 in Summersworth. We played them. Uh, we upset Sauhegan to get there. It was a, it was a good game. They were undefeated going into the playoff. No, we got our butts handed to us the week before playoffs, and they were we were playing them first week in playoffs, and we smoked them. So, what year of high school was that for you? It was my junior year. Junior year, all right. Yeah, junior year is a good year. What did you learn from playing football? Um, junior was the best year. Uh, it was a lot of teamwork, a lot of camaraderie, um, a lot of friends hanging out. We, uh, every Friday night before football games, because we always played on Saturday, we didn't have lights. Um, we'd, go, <laughs> we'd go over to Claremont and play Walmart tag. Um, and you'd hear over the loudspeaker with the Newport football team, please leave the building. <laughs> um, so, and we, but we had a tight knit team and we were, we were good friends and good buddies. And that's, I think that's why we we're successful. Teamwork and sportsmanship, good. Yeah. Um, who was your coach and your teammates that like you might want to no shout out and are you still oh, teammates shout close out. with them today? Um, I ha I talked with a few of them. Um, my head coach was Larry Carl. I think he's retired. Um, and my defensive coach was Bill Thurlow, who's he's got 50 plus years of coaching high school football. Um, and I think he's still going. I think he still helps out with Newport. Um, so he's been coaching a long time. Um, and so those are my coaches. My Guys, I still know Steve Smith was the center on our team. He, he does radio over in Newport uh, for WCNL. Um, Ryan Hurd was a quarterback. So there's um, Richard Holmes running back, senior running back. Um, so a lot of good athletes there. All right, let's shift gears now to skiing. I know skiing is something that you're passionate about, and I've heard yeah. you're pretty good at it still, but uh, you don't talk about it a lot. Mm -hmm. What was it like skiing in high school? Skiing in high school is just a way to get out of school to go skiing. Um, literally, we had we take every week we'd have a, a day where we'd just get out and we'd go over to the Sunapee or King Ridge back in the day or some other. I think we went up to Cannon and Cranmore, um, but it was just a way to go skiing. Um, and I did okay. I wasn't the greatest skier, like ski racer. I yeah. mean, but I did I did it and I had fun with it. Um, so it was like I said, I liked skiing. I loved the snow days. I loved the, to get out of the and go. Um, is there anybody you met skiing who's noteworthy or taught you anything? Or just experiences that you like, oh man, this day we went up to this mountain and I remember this was going I on. remember my dad always used to, again, before high school, he'd always pull us out of school for a, a, a sick day and we'd go up to Cannon and we'd, we'd ski. Um, so I remember my dad giving us like those playing hooky and, and, and going up and doing that. So um, probably my dad, we'd ski with my dad a lot. You think your passion for skiing came from your dad? I think so. I think he was involved in it a lot. Um, my mom skied, but not a whole lot. Um, so it was more my dad and then just doing it in high school. And I think because I went to school in Florida for college, um, that just drove it even more, like, because I was so far away and I wanted to get back and I wanted to, to ski. You have posters up here of skiing in your room. Um, do you follow professional skiing or do you just like enjoy going? I do. I always course. like watching the Olympics and the skiing and, and sitting down in front of the TV and watching. I remember um, uh, Peekaboo Street back in the, the 90s when she was racing and getting gold medals. I'm trying to think of the guy who won the gold medal, um, Tommy Moe. And then, of course, Bodie Miller growing up here, um, a New Hampshire guy and, and watching him over the years. And I think that's. I mean, skiing is just a way for me to get outside. I love being outside. I love being in doing stuff, uh, obviously hiking, biking, mountain biking. Um, and skiing is just another vehicle to get me, no pun intended, to get me out on the slopes and, 
and having fun. Yeah. Um, so, and now I enjoy doing it with my kids. My my son Tucker loves it. That's so great. Yeah. We get to go a lot, so he loves that. What are your favorite ski resorts that you've ever been to, not just in New Hampshire? Um, back in 2010, I got the opportunity to go out west to Utah, to Park City. And so Park City, Deer Valley, the canyons, um, Alta, so all those resorts out there. It was, it was a different experience than out here. But locally, how so? Yeah. Bigger size um, and the snow. So the size, I mean, they put the small, the resorts here like tiny. Killington would probably be small compared to what they're out there. So that's why. But locally, I mean, I like the backwoods, like uh, Mad River Glen, uh, JP, Sunapee. I grew up skiing at Sunapee, so I like going there. I, I'm, now it's a little bit more commercial, but it's an easy mountain. Um, trying to think of some other ones I think we can get. Little areas, little areas where you can go have fun. That's good. So for track, I heard you were quite the track star in high school. Yeah, I did. I did okay. Again, junior year, again, my, it was my better year. Um, yeah, I was a, a strong thrower and a sprinter as well. So I did well at those, always going to the, the class. We had class meets, there, our division meets. Um, back then we were classes. Um, so I'd always go and be able to compete. And I think it started my sophomore year, excelling at the javelin and discus, um, and then throwing the sprinting as well. How'd you get into track? I couldn't hit a baseball. <laughs> <laughs> seriously um i uh i just wasn't good at baseball i could never hit I, and so i was like i gotta do something and I, i'm that the athlete type thing and i just wanted to go play a sport so i ended up getting into track and i think my buddy josh was into it too so he kind of so got involved with him too um what accomplishments from track do you feel like are noteworthy um i always remember going to like the london dairy invitationals and the big type of and i remember getting second place in discus down at one of the bigger high school meets. Yeah. Um, the summer between my junior and senior year, my track coach got us involved in the junior Olympics. So I qualified at Brown, like the Northeast meet, to the Northeast regional meet up at University of Maine in Orono. And I ended up qualifying there for javelin and discus to, to go participate in the National Junior Olympics down at uh, Gainesville, down at the University of Florida. Wow. Um, I didn't do too well down there, but I still qualified, I guess. So that's feather in my hat I guess that's cool um so what experiences did you take away from high school not only you know in sports but also academically or the people teachers you met and use that uh still to this day in your everyday life um probably academics my my uh industrial arts teacher I guess you what used to be and what I teach if, if what I teach now was back then it would be called industrial arts um Mr. Barrett was my one of my favorite teachers and I taught, I took CAD, architecture, drafting. We had drafting classes. Now it's all computer, um, computerized. So I think just, you know, I wish I did more of the academics in college and take what I went, learned in, at high school to college instead of going to college for something else that I wanted to do. So when, you know, for us now in high school, a lot of us are deciding where we want to go to college. You made that decision. You chose to go south and went to Florida. Um, How did you make that decision? And what advice do you have for us who are in that process right now? My neighbor growing up, and I'd mow his lawns, and he was a he was an airline pilot for Northwest Airlines. He flew 757s. And every year, and this is probably um, every year he's single, he'd buy himself a new Harley Davidson. So he has like six or seven Harley Davidsons. He had a Toyota Land Cruiser, he had a Porsche Boxster. And so I was like, dang. Like, I want to do that. Um, and that's kind of where my, my dream of becoming a pilot came from. Um, not knowing what engineering was back then, because it was still not new. Obviously, engineers have been around, but I wish I knew more about that. Because I wish Mr. Barrett maybe would have pushed me in that direction a little more versus me saying, oh, I want to go to school to fly airplanes. Yeah. So, but I mean, it's, and it's, it was an experience. So, Daytona, Florida. Yeah. college you get there you're learning about planes what was that like you get there and you're able to fly planes it's like i'm not in high school anymore yeah um obviously going to school in florida let alone daytona beach is, is insane so you had to obviously <laughs> it'd be a special kind of person to go down there and do that um i didn't fly right off 
I flew my second semester and that was that was cool because you end up going the way the step through is private pilots license you get that here's a semester and so it's just like a college class so instead of taking like math well I had to take math instead of taking that you take um, private pilot so you learn how to fly a plane you could go to ground school and with your instructor so that was your major um, yeah aeronautical science what other things were you interested in as like maybe a minor or a different class to take in case that didn't work out or in preparation for being a pilot again i wish i would have done the engineering for that um but my minor was in aviation weather um meteorological yeah. science so that's what my minor was in um, and that was that was cool too i like the weather classes i like the science behind that i think i was learning like that. So that was interesting. I remember an aerospace engineering class last year, you spoke a little bit briefly about um, just like how at one point you had been getting a little bit of flying experience with an instructor. And then I think at one point you were able to go up on your own. Yeah. What was that experience like? It was, I guess it's like kind of like driving a car. So you work with the instructor, you learn, you know, and you're like, hey, I could do this. And then all of a sudden he's like, here's the keys. And you get to go up and go for a flight instead of drive for drive down the interstate. So um, they make sure, obviously, that you know what you're doing. And you're fully capable of, of doing it. So, but yeah, it's, it's definitely different. Are you aware of any changes in society since you were in college in terms of, like, the access to flying or the ability for youth to get into aviation and learn about that do you think it's expanded or there's less of it available or there's you know more regulation around it so it's more difficult to get hands-on experience yeah I think um obviously I went to college from 95 to 2000 and of course 2001 the World Trade Center happened um so I think that kind of shifted some things a little bit um but now I think it's still available it's still there if you wanted to go do it or for anybody else wanted to go after that it's still readily available I think you can go to like locally you can get um, flight instruction down Concord or Laconia. Um, I know a couple of students are doing flight lessons now um, with that. And I know through college, I still see like the Facebook post from Embry Riddle, um, and that's still big time down there. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, after college, in between there and becoming a teacher, what happened? <laughs> it was about four years. I hated Florida. I absolutely, I mean, go back to the skiing. I, there was, I just didn't want to be in Florida. Yeah, it was nice going to February break and um, actually February break, I'd come here, but after like to go out to the beach during college since then all my friends are at home at UNH go freezing their butts off. So um, I came back home. So I came back to Newport and was trying to get my flight instructor's license. Being a pilot's mm -hmm. all about hours. So you need to build the hours in order to get on with a major so airline. So similar with like driving as like you have to log your hours. Yeah, you have to log hours and you have to, and it was like a thousand hours that just to start in with like a commuter airline, some, somebody small flying out of like Manchester, well not Manchester, but Lev or, or Manchester, smaller Manchester, um, like Cape Air or something like that. And so I was doing my flight instructor thing and then like November rolled around and it was getting dark and I'd usually like, I had to get a job because you have to pay for loans. So after my job, I'd usually drive over Laconia an hour and a half. Um, to fly but now I'm, we're talking like I'm working till five at night it's dark out I can't fly so I ended up getting a job at Mount Sonope driving snowcat and so I'd work from midnight to eight in the morning get out at eight in the morning drive over to Laconia fly um, and do that so that's what I did that first winter um, how did you get any sleep <laughs> you'd come back and then I'd, I'd go to sleep around noon and sleep till like eight or nine at night uh -huh. try to anyway um, Sometimes that didn't quite happen because nobody else in the house was sleeping at that time. Yeah. And so in the spring, I ended up blowing my knee out um, skiing after it wasn't flying that day, but I went up skiing after my shift and I ended up crashing in the tourney park. Um, so that kind of put a stop to flying for a while. Um, I ended up getting a job with a local construction company because obviously I can't groom during the summer. Yeah. Um, working with him. And it, that was the time my buddy Will who did the Air Force Reserve and he was flying um, A-10s. So started chatting with him and talking to him. It's like, he's like, yeah, you should do the Air Force Reserve. Um, so um, I needed to drop weight. I needed to be uh, a certain weight, 215, I think. And I was up to 230s or under 20% body fat. So that was um, 
So I had to get down. And so I started to do that. That brought me into the next winter. Finally, the following spring, I was ready to start applying. And my buddy, Jared, um, asked me if I wanted to be a police officer down in Martha's Vineyard. I'm like, oh, that's going to look good on a resume. So I'm going to go do that. Still getting in shape for the Air Force. Yeah. Um, and I ended up catching on with a recruiter and some bad stuff, not bad stuff, but um, miscommunication. And he wasn't the best at that. And so I'd show up to Boston and sign in for take a test. And they're like, oh, we don't have any information on you. We can't allow you to take the test because my recruiter didn't give it to him. And then another time we had to, not to get into the big story, but um, there was another time where I showed up at the base and he's like, well, you can't park there. We got to go off the base. And then we came back on the base. And by the time we did all that, I showed up to the door at five minutes late and it was closed. So I was like, well, we're late. We can't, we can't take the test today. You want to go get a coffee? I was like, no, I want some choice words for him. Uh, so I was fuming at that point. And so that's the summer that my dad called me up and said, they're looking for a long-term sub at, at Stevens High School teaching woodshop and computer drafting. And I needed a job from the police officer gig, which ended in September to Christmas or till snow fell. So yeah. I get, so I could go, uh, sorry. So I can go back to driving snowcat. So I was like, all right, it's a three month job. They're paying a hundred bucks a day. I could do this. Um, I hated every minute of it. Um, obviously, you know how. <laughs> and kids, now you, you're, yeah, exactly. you're working here. Yeah. So obviously, you know how kids do, eat, uh, treat long substitutes, let alone long term subs. So, but at the end of the gig, they were like, hey, if you want it, there's a job there for you next summer because the guy you're subbing for is retiring. It's like, no, I'm good. Don't worry about it. I'm good. And so um, the following summer after ski season, um, at this point, I'm still trying to do the Air Force thing. I thought I finally caught on with a with recruiter, got to the weight, got the scores, and got where I wanted to be. And um, Claremont gave me a call and said, hey, the job's yours if you want it. And so I took it. Long term, uh, it was a position, benefits, vacations, wasn't working from midnight to eight in the morning. Um, and it was teaching computer drafting and woodshop. Yeah. So that's how I started back in 2004. I got a job teaching in Claremont. So would you say you took it up because of like, it was just the benefits or, you know, maybe partially this and the other thing. And also you talking about woodshop and computer classes. And that's like a lot of the stuff you're doing now. Is that because those are the subjects you're passionate about? Yeah. My parents were both teachers. My mom was a home ec teacher now consumer science. And my dad was uh, taught building construction at the tech center in Claremont. So that's kind of how I got the in. Um, and we'd always build stuff and that's kind of the wood shop. And I was used to like Nor watch Norm Abram. I don't know if you probably don't New Yankee workshop and videos like that. And, um, so I'd always watch that stuff growing up and it was I remember, fa it fascinated me. I'd make you watch these videos. And, yeah. When I was a yeah. freshman. Yeah. You made us watch that when you weren't here. <laughs> yeah. Sub plans. Yeah. So, and I like, and I, I like that. I mean, my dad helped me build my bed, my bureau. So we built a lot of projects in I think you and I are very similar in that aspect of like, we both like to work with our hands and kind of build things yeah. ourselves as opposed to buying it. Like it's just that much more fulfilling and you're able to do it yourself and figure it out. And I just enjoy that process yeah. as well. Yeah. And so um, teaching, I had to get certified and obviously I could work with my dad and, and I went an alternative route where I had to prove like I was, a, I was confident to teach this. And so, like you said, my experience from high school and, and doing all that stuff, I had the CAD background, um, the woodshop stuff. My, I worked with my dad, so I was able to do that. And over the course, I got of a, a couple of years, three years, I think, I got certified to teach. Yeah. So it was legal. <laughs> <laughs> so you're at Claremont for a while. Anything major that you took away from there? Um, yeah. I mean, it was, again, it's one of those communities, much like Newport, where I grew up, that we and I was able, I coached football there. I coached track there. Um, I coached indoor track there as well. And so it was fun to coach in Claremont. I always claim that I'm, I'm Owen or no, 4 and 0 as a coach slash player against Claremont or something. <laughs> so it was like, or Claremont Newport, that series. So it's, um, that's fun to be able to know the coaches that I coached against or played for. And so, yeah. Yeah, so then all of a sudden at one point you switch and you come over to here to Hopkinton. What was it about Hopkinton that jumped out to you as like, yeah, this is where I should be? Um, 
my mom always loved Hoffington. She'd drive through. She's like, oh, that's a great community. I, was, I always, that was in the back of my mind. Um, but to be honest, I mean, when I was teaching in Claremont, the morale started to go down and it wasn't a fun place to teach anymore. Was it because of like the energy of just like the students and the teachers and just what it's like I to walk in every day? I think. Or it just got old? It not got old, but it got, it, it changed a little bit. It's, there was a, a change in a superintendent and the new superintendent was brought in to cut money and, and change things up a little bit. And it just got to be the people I'd work with were complaining. And you, it's like a workplace that you just feel like, eh, yeah, feel like it started to get a sour taste. Um, and at that point I met, I had just met my future wife, um, not knowing obviously back then. And I was just looking around and I saw like on one of the job sites, it was like, um, Hoppington. I was like, what the heck? I'm going to, I'm going to apply and see what happens. Um, and weirdly enough, and I remember this, uh, Mrs. Putnam, who is the office uh, lady, she called me up and said, hey, we, we scheduled you for an interview next week. I'm like, well, I, I can't interview because I'm, I'm going to South Carolina for training for a class that I need to teach. It's like, oh, okay. She's like, well, we can do a phone interview. I was like, no, I hate, hate talking on the phone. I don't want to do a phone interview. Yeah. So we actually Skyped. And I remember Mr. Chamberlain and Mr. Kelly and having an interview there and having this panel of, of people out and like over a video conference. So was much, that 10 years now? Yeah, it was 10 years ago. This is my 10th year here. Wow. So, um, and I got the job. I remember Mr. Chamberlain calling back later in the day and say, hey, if we'd like to have you, if you want to come. And so, but yeah, definitely. And so that's how I, and then, so now I had to call Claremont who I was down teaching or taking this class on their bill um, and say, um, I'm not coming back. <laughs> so. It went over okay. It's yeah. not as bad as you thought it would be. I resign as teacher over at Claremont. You write that in a napkin and leave like Belichick did with the Jets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So no, I yeah, my wife or my girlfriend at the time made me call. She's like, you gotta talk to me. You gotta explain like what happened and why. And so weirdly enough, the principal at the high school at that time was my old guidance counselor from Newport. So I had a I had a good connection with Mr. Sprague and we chatted about it. And, so you've been teaching engineering and woodshop at Hopkinton. What has that experience been like? And now you got all this cool technology. You got your laser cutter. It's, you got your 3D printer. I remember the first day Mr. Kelly walked me into this room. And well, I still have the video on my phone. And I said, I should show you sometime. It was, I mean, Mr. Ronald is, he's one of those teachers that, those legacy teachers that you replace. Like he's, he was firmly in, entrenched in this place. Uh, and the room showed it. And it was just crazy. And so... Just trying to evolve the program a little bit. I know he did a lot with it, and um, through the Project Lead the Way program, we added aerospace um, and engineering design and development, and so I, to build the program up. And I've been dreaming about this lab for years. And finally, um, Mrs. Gagnon, I think, was one of the drivers behind um, getting the money in here because she's like, "Oh, let's combine it with science, and then now we can have science classes and then engineering, and just kind of make sense." It was like a perfect marriage. Um, and so this is the second year in this room that where they redesigned it and built it up and it, it, looks great. Yeah, it coincided with some grant money. So we've got some cool technology now and um, it's come a long way. And I think we've done a, a, a good job with it. And of course, the kids help with that, too. And getting kids like you guys and you and a bunch of others. So, yeah, it's been a good, a nice experience. Yeah, well, uh, I um, remember walking in here just as a middle schooler, and it wasn't, you know, always the most appealing thing, but, like, I I have a family history of engineers in my family, so I always kind of thought in the back of my mind, engineering might be something for me. I remember having you in eighth grade, and, yeah. like, you, I thought you were a really great teacher and everything, and, yep. yeah, not anymore, but no, not sure. anymore. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you've been a really great teacher for me over these years, and I wasn't sure if I was going to go to engineering, but now I'm going to major in mechanical engineering next year. So thank you so much. I don't know if that happens without you, yeah. truly. So I appreciate you working with me, helping to inspire me and kind of encourage me along in the process, yeah. even if there's crazy ideas like a snow glider yeah. or what have you. I think it's, those are some of the things and not just don't take this the wrong <laughs> way that you, I mean, a lot of times in engineering, you learn by failing. And you learn how to change things and make it better and evolve it. And that's kind of trying to get that out of you type of stuff. Like, hey, give it a shot, but hey, know that it might not work. Um, and if that's the case, don't just give up on it and say, well, screw it. I'm not going to do it. 
figure it out and try a better way. And I think that's what one of the things you were adamant about. You just kept at it. Like this is gonna work and this is gonna happen. So and that's the mindset that you want. Yeah. You want the kids to have that. Um, I know other kids have done their senior projects and they haven't worked out so well and some have. So I mean it's that just it's the way the thing goes. Yeah. And I feel like uh when I do these interviews, there's like a lot of life lessons that are kind of baked within this. And it's good to be able to get that out of that because sometimes people come in and see you and they kind of miss some of that I think you know just everyday conversations we have with people we don't always dig deep and kind of figure it out I feel like part of the thing with engineering is perseverance kind of what you were just getting at and like learning to adapt and work and it's a process it's not going to be done overnight but if you can stick with it you can achieve something new yeah and it's great when you get the kids you can see that they get it and it clicks and that's that's what really makes it worth it like you can see that they understand they're getting stuff out of it um, and enjoying it yeah all right well uh, thank you so much mr christie truly appreciate it